Good morning and a happy Sabbath to all of you who have tuned in this morning. I want to welcome you again to another Sabbath school at the Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church. What a wonderful day it is today, and I want to wish you season's greetings. You know, many of you are at home, wrapping up in your warm blankets, sitting next to your children, your wife, your husband, and you have tuned in this morning, but I know that you're thinking of the wonderful things that you have in store to enjoy today. I don't know. What's going on? Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and may God's presence and sweet communion be with you. But one thing I will ask you to please remember that today is about Jesus Christ who came to this earth to die for us. So please think of him as you join your family on this day of celebration. Thank you. Understand. Thank you, Elder Valsi. Good morning to everyone and welcome to Croydon Sabbath School panel. We're so grateful that you can join us as we open God's word. And a special shout out to those of you who are getting up extra early across the waters to be able to join us on this Sabbath morning. Did you all tune in last week and have a wonderful Sabbath morning with our youth? They didn't disappoint as ever. And a, a special shout out to Sister Stephanie Hall because there were many young people who due to illness, weren't able to fulfill their duties, and she just made it um, come through smoothly under the, the guidance of the Lord. And it was good to see back in the hosting chair, Sister Sarah Augusta, so calm, cool, and collected. Young people, we were so blessed. So all of you continue to do God's work. We, we are blessed to see you leading out and continue to spread the word and spread the message um, as you deliver God's word. And some of you will know that usually there was a face in Sabbath school that is normally there, Sister Kai Barton. Well, guess what? I got a message from Kai this morning, just thanking the church for prayers and wishing us a happy Sabbath. And the most important thing, she sent that message from home. Kai is home with her family. We praise the Lord and continue to raise her up in prayer. So thank you, Kai, for your message. If you're tuning in this morning, it's so great that you can be at home on this Sabbath morning. We want to get into the study of God's word and we are going to be using our Sabbath school quarterlies as they are called, the Adult Study Guide. If you don't have one, go to the website that will appear on the screen and you can download a copy for yourselves. Welcome to those who are tuning in on Life Radio as well. So good to hear from you. So we want everybody to interact with us as normal. So if you're on YouTube or live stream, send your comments and questions in the chat in the usual way. If you're tuning in on Life Radio, remember you can send a message to studio at liferadio.uk or you can even send your message on WhatsApp and the number is 07311 So we're going to dig into God's word, but as usual, we have our panelists with us and we welcome back our senior pastor, Pastor Royston. Good morning, Pastor. Um, Elder Johnny, I don't know if I should say Merry Christmas to you. You can do. Or I should not say to Elder Valsi. I'm not too sure. Um, because I'm, I'm sure. But, but you know, it's, it's, it's good to be alive on the final Sabbath of 2021. And I think for me, it's good to be spending it with you in this morning. Because I think we've been on this journey for a, quite a long time. And um, yes, so, so, so thank you for you know, the times that we have spent together. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Pastor. It sounds like if you're going somewhere. Well, I'm not going anywhere at the moment anyway, but thank you very much for your kind words. We also welcome back Sister Sharon Douglas. Good morning, Sharon. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be studying with you all today. 
Thank you. And last but by no, no means least, um, Elder David Mbildic. Good morning, Dave. Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one. Again, a wonderful pleasure. And just to help Pastor Royce now, greetings of the season, I think is what we normally say if we have any doubt about people's beliefs on this matter. That's okay. Thank you very much. So before we dig into God's word, we are going to be favored by a special musical item from our own Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Gospel Choir, singing for us this morning, Glory to God in the Highest. you for today as the song says glory to God and Lord we, we we this is the final Sabbath of 2021 and we want to thank you it has been a very challenging year but glory to God and Lord we will be launching next week Sabbath into 2021 a new lesson and I'll be here to be a part of that process by your grace. Glory to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor, and thank you to our gospel choir. That took me back. Glory to God in the highest. So we're at our very last lesson in this quarter's series, Present Truth in Deuteronomy. And today we are looking at the resurrection of Moses. Our memory verse is taken from Jude 9, and it says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed <clears throat> excuse me, about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. We're going to dig into that a little further as we go into our lesson study. So by way of an introduction, for there to be a resurrection, there must, of course, have been a death. And that is true of Moses. 
the central mortal of the book of Deuteronomy. Now, throughout this quarter, we have learned so much about Moses' character and his final sermon and charge to the children of Israel before they entered the promised land. He ministered present truth to that new generation of children of Israel, and this week's lesson was no exception. Father Royston, now, for over 40 years, Moses was God's mouthpiece. You know, Moses was close to God, but Moses was God's mouthpiece and not the other way around, and that's important. So when in service for God, how important is it always to remember who you are and who God is regardless? Um, Very good um, question, Elder Johnny. I am just looking online and members are, you know, my my virtual viewers are saying it seemed like pasta is leaving. I'm I'm going to be here. (coughs) Yes, you frightened a few people. Yes, yes. So just to encourage them to say that, you know, I'm going to be here. Um, But the question you have raised, I think, um, can I make a point? And then I will address the point that you have raised. Sure. I've made a note here in my lesson study, and I had a long conversation with one of our um, good friends. We have become very good friends, Sister Angela Green. She's she's online. I can see her. and Angel, we were talking about the fact that Satan wants to claim our destiny mm. and, and control the narrative, regardless of who you are, um, especially if you're God's chosen mantelpiece. And we had this, and we talked about the fact that um, one rash decision can be destructive. And so, That is why it is important that when God calls you to be his mouthpiece, that all the things that are happening in your life, you do not take credit for it. Now, that's the issue with many of us preachers. We become too big for our own boots, you know? We we, we, we begin to get so um, caught up in what we're doing and I becomes the center of everything. And I, think, and I think the point you have raised about Moses, for, for many years Moses, you know, um, was focused on God. But then he got to the point where he got frustrated and then he started focusing on himself. And we see, we see what the problem, what, 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 what caused that. So we need to remember, <clears throat> even as children of God, that God is in control, we're God's mouthpiece, and we should not, we should not, we should never reach to the point where we think that it is because of us. Mm. And I think the lesson is going to come clear with that, isn't it? Interesting. That Moses felt, he says, we, look, you know, we, he used the word we. No, 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 God. And so as preachers, let us not forget that it is not us, it is God. Amen. That's interesting. I mean, I wasn't targeting the question to ministers or preachers specifically, but um, an interesting um, testimony there. Thank you for sharing that, Pastor. So, do you agree with Pastor Royston? When in service for God, how important is it to always remember who you are and who God is regardless? Send us your answers or your thoughts on that, and Pastor Royston will share them. Um, as he usually does. Thank you. So the lesson opens with a flashback to something that was recorded in the book of Numbers. Sister Sharon, coming to you first of all, remind us what took place. If you can start off with Numbers 20, verses 1 through to 8, please. Okay, and I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. And it says... Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Sin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, 
If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought us up out of the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water thus. You shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So here um, we see that there were two water from the rock events that sort of served as bookends for the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The first time is very soon after crossing the Red Sea. So the account that I've just read in Numbers is similar to the account in Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7. Both involved a complaint against Moses about a lack of water. Both occurred at Meribah. Both involved the rod being mentioned. Both involved Moses and Aaron removing themselves from the assembly of the people and going to the door of the tabernacle to seek God, which is a good thing. When we are surrounded with negativity and critics, we need to enter into the presence of God where we can find strength, clarity, wisdom, direction. Both resulted in water being produced. Um, we see in this account the same pattern of behaviour which had been displayed by the former generation, their fathers. So history was repeating itself, that pattern of complaining. And, you know, they were singing really the same song. When we look in verse three, um, they speak about um, the fact that they wish they had died like their brethren had died before them. Now, if we remember in number 16, several um, chapters before, that there had been a rebellion by Korah. Mm. And um, in that rebellion, there was a quick death. The ground opened up and swallowed a number of people. It was around about 250. Many were leaders as well. So they were saying, you know, that way we would have died quickly. It wouldn't be this slow death through um, first. When we look at verse 4, we hear them speaking of how Moses and Aaron had brought them and their cattle out um, to die. And it's like they had this conspiracy theory going on. And then we look at verse five and they talk about the fact that they had been brought out of Egypt to this evil place. Well, they got that wrong. Mm. They were being oppressed in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. Egypt was an evil place, not where God was trying to um, bring them. So um, we see that um, they also mentioned in that same verse about some of these kind of like produce, seeds, figs, pomegranate. And if we remember when um, the spies went to spy out the land and God told them to go up and take the land, these were some of the things that were were there but at that time they were saying no we can't go and possess the land because there's giants so there was like no pleasing them yeah and then in verse eight we see god being very pacific mm. you know he told moses to take the rod which was a sign of god's authority and power and to gather the people and show them his power Amen. And so we see the preciseness, just like when in the Garden of Eden, God has said to Adam and Eve, don't eat from the tree of good of knowledge. Yes. So what I wanted to go on and say, and I know I've been a bit long, Johnny, <laughs> but um, um, when we complain, we see things differently. It skews our thinking. Mm. We see evil um, as good and good as evil. If we're honest, we would have um, to admit that we sometimes complain. When God isn't coming through to, for us in the way we want, we accuse him of being absent or disinterested. But when our hearts 
when our heart is concerned with God's purposes rather than our own, we will be patient and we will trust him to provide what we need. Thank you. Then we won't develop the bad habit of complaining. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that synopsis there. So, so Elder David, we see Moses and Aaron, they went and sought the Lord's advice. Continue for us. Verses 9 through to 13, please. Uh, certainly, yes. Um, and it says in verse 9, And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded. So far, so good. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye, uh, because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now, um, we find here that um, Moses did exactly the right thing. And again, wonderful lessons to be learned when we have a crisis, when we have a challenge. The first thing that we do is to go and communicate with our God. Um, we see that often in, in David. And David, you know, before he went into battle or anything like that, he said, uh, uh, it, it, it is uh, written that he consulted with the Lord. What should we do? Should we go up? Should we stay? Should we fight? And, and God would give these directions. And so Moses, up to this point, has done the right thing. He's basically consulted the Lord, and the Lord has given him specific instructions. We, we know that. So Moses took uh, the rod, as it says, and went to the people. But then his own passion takes over. Mm. His own passion. And remember that in the midst of all of this, that we're not dealing with flesh and blood, but we're dealing with other entities. And so we have to appreciate also that Satan's in the mix as well. Mm. And what we find that he expresses a level of passion. Now, re remember, this passion is something that God spent 40 years trying to get out of him after he murdered uh, the Egyptian uh, some um, 80 years before. And, um, uh, and it's been a long road, but that residual passion, that residual anger problem that Moses had rears its ugly head again. And, rose, and Moses then takes it upon himself to follow his own guidelines based upon what God had previously um, told him uh, in the story that they allude, um, Sharon alluded to. And he struck the rock. And um, the result was is that the water came out and happy days. Everybody seems to be happy. Mm -hmm. the, the result is that the children of Israel got water and the animals as well got water as well. But we do see that God says, listen, um, Moses and Aaron, because ye Believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, ye shall not bring this congregation. So the objective is never about the physical. When we, when we have a need, when we have a want, it's never about that. There's always a deeper spiritual message. And it's not so much what's in your heart. It's how it's being perceived. Mm. You know, let not your good be evil spoken of. So it, you could be doing good because that's most was uh, the objective of Moses. But it's how it's perceived. And, and uh, Pastor Royston, I'm sure, will agree with me and you, Johnny, that as leaders, um, in spite of your desire to do good, um, you, could be, you could be right in your intentions, but wrong in the way in which you deliver that communication. That's right. And that's the problem which Moses had uh, here. He was wrong in delivering this, uh, uh, this message and therefore could not be... Um, uh, trusted, to, well, I wouldn't say trusted, but, to, you know, it would be under this cloud that he would enter into the promised land. Um, and, and this was the wrong impression. And God had to um, try to do something to rescind that. And, and that was by not allowing them to go into the promised land. But mm -hmm. interestingly, if you go back to Numbers 14, when uh, uh, based upon the rebellion, um, after the, the spies went in, um, uh, um, and Joshua and Caleb came out with a good report, it was at that point that God said, only you two would be allowed back in. 
There was no mention of Aaron that's right. or Moses that's at right. that point. That's right. A very interesting thing to consider. Yep, yep, that same point came to me. Um, just before I go to Pastor Sharon, you got anything briefly to add to, to what Elder David shared there? Um, okay, just to say, in, in terms of the whole issue about um, anger, just to add to what David said. So, you know, while Moses' um, anger could be seen as righteous indignation, as it were, we need to be careful not to justify most of our anger as righteous. Mm. Um, there was a Scottish hymn um, writer, George Matheson, who said, there are times when I do well to be angry, but I have mistaken the times. Or Aristotle said, anyone can become angry, that's easy. But to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, and in the right way, that is not easy. Mm. You know, we know that the Bible says in Ephesians that we should be angry, but sin um, not. The point that I'm just simply making that, you know, maybe your besetting sin isn't anger, but whatever keeps um, you tripping up, um, keeps us tripping up. Mm. We need to identify that, bring it to God mm. uh, so that we don't stumble at the finishing line. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pastor Royston, anything coming in on that? Yes, we, we are flooded with points. Um, <clears throat> Erlene, Lynette, Lynette, Caroline, Anif, Katty, Rodney, and even um, our own Elder Peter Burton says, um, God never changes. Um, Donna and Anthony and Sonson Son basically says to us that... Um, when we focus on self, it excludes God. Yes. Kathleen says, without him, we can do nothing. Angela Green made a point. I'm going to read this point um, because I said we had a long conversation. She says, the servant of God are not to act out of the di dictates of the natural heart. We need to have close communion with God in case on the provocation, self rises up. Mm. That's a powerful thought. This is Elder Johnny. Mm. Here's a thought again coming from um, Caroline says, first it shows how much negative influence can cause even strong and spiritual, I'm going to put people of God to fall down. Yes. Therefore, total concentration to God and depending on him is very, very crucial. Powerful, powerful thought that Elder Johnny. Here's another thought from my friend early over there in... Um, <coughs> Um, in, uh, I've just forgotten now, That's in, okay. in Montreal, okay. in Montreal. And, and, and she, she's saying here that, that we need God to be, be our guide mm -hmm. and we need God to, to, to control us. Rodney Smith says, the impatient Moses who 80 years ago killed a man now jumps up out of nowhere. The gospel is true. Only Jesus saves. Mm. Here is my, my good friend, um, Elder Lawrence Augustus. He says, this discontentment is a struggle for many Christians today. Sometimes we can be so focused in the moment we fail to see God's blessing and provision. You know, taking our eyes off God is a very, very dangerous yeah. thing. Um, here, let me go now on to our um, um, to our um, YouTube? Live stream. Live stream. Live stream. Okay. Sorry about that. Akusa says, God uses us to, to achieve his purposes, but it's important to remember that he, he's God all by himself. That's right. Powerful. He doesn't need us. We need him. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, Brother Moambi says, the devil is extremely cunning. He can make human beings start to feel that they can make it on their own, even when they are serving God. We can sin in the midst of doing what is supposedly to be good. Jan VM, it is important to always remember that all good things that come to us were brought to us by God, not by our own power, mm. especially when we are abundantly blessed. I'm yeah. going to read something from Clive here. Clive Johnson, it is very important as we will be able to do anything as, as we'll be able to do anything our Lord allows. But we have seen with our fellow believers attempt to shut us down, thinking it's not possible to think beyond human capacity. I think I get the point he's saying here. Remembering, um, Rose says, remembering we are should humble us, knowing that just like God is using a, a sinner like us, he will also use others. In short, not I, but Christ. Amen. Thank you. There's a question, Elder Johnny. I oh, want okay. to throw it. Somebody asked a question here, and I think Rodney Smith had asked a question 
Rodney, can you retype your... No, sorry, it's Anthony Bromble. He says, did Moses err because he allowed his emotions to overpower his reason? If so, what does this teach us about controlling our emotions under all circumstances? I think, Elder Johnny, as we go forward... That's what I was going to say. That, yeah. that, that question will be answered. Can I roll a thought in, Elder Johnny, go and ahead. then I come back to you? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No problem. Um, I remembered when I was in, in, high, when, when I was in college, I, I kind of did well. And um, I kind of was showing off. You? And my professor no. said to me, kind of, not really. My professor said to me, he, he says, he says, praise is like perfume. Smell it but do not consume it. Mm. It will poison you. Powerful. Wow. Yeah. Powerful. Good points. Thank you. Keep them coming in. And those of you that are joining us on Life Radio, we want to hear from you in the, your usual way of getting in touch. So, interesting points. Let me go out with another question. Now, in life, there are some people that just seem to wind you up. Do not mention any names. Do not look across the ro room. Okay. There are some people that just some, seem to. There are some people. There are some people that, that just seem to wind just seem you to, up. Words and actions. Words and act. Just seem to irritate. Um, I was getting irritated by my own voice there. Hopefully, um, we're coming over clearly now. So here's my question: How do you handle that predicament, especially? as your soul salvation is literally at stake. You know, Moses and Aaron, and specifically Moses, went to seek the Lord, but it was the people that were frustrating him. So how do you deal, or how do you handle the predicament of people winding you up, or you getting annoyed, I should say, especially when your soul salvation is literally at stake? We want to hear from you. In the meantime, as those thoughts are coming in, although it seems somewhat hypocritical for us nowadays, sinful human beings, to examine the sin of Moses, let's just take a further look in more detail at what transpired. Elder David, coming to you first of all. Now, considering what Moses did or failed to do was so bad, how come water still came out of the rock? What's your thoughts on that? I think that's a very good question. Um, and um, we have to look at the relationship which God and Moses had. Now, as um, Sharon alluded to earlier, uh, I believe it was in um, Exodus 17, verse 6, um, God did give Moses power um, to strike the rock and water came out. Um, and from the way I look at it, God does not rescind uh, sometimes the power that he gives us because of uh, mistakes. And the overall objective, or one of the objective, was to feed the children of Israel, or uh, give them water and their animals. This was a need. And um, so the way in which I see it is that God um, was not going to allow um, the children of Israel to suffer because of the mistakes um, physically suffer because of the mistakes which Moses made. Um, but uh, what should have happened um, in terms of Moses um, actually communicating and saying the word um, was that the children of Israel, and, the, and remember that the whole universe is, is looking down um, at these scenes unfolding. And what um, they would have seen is that there would have been a uh, an, an evolutionary process, spiritually, I'm talking about. I know we don't like to use the word evolution, but, uh, but, but a development um, from Moses having to use this, this, this rod as a, a symbol of God's power to actually being in a position where God is now saying, I am going to speak through you. And when you open your mouth, I will literally be speaking um, as, as in creation. And God said, let there be. And the children of Israel would have witnessed a transformation in Moses as he, as, uh, at this stage of his development. And this is sometimes what happens to us, is that sometimes we get to a point in our spiritual life where God wants to take us to another level. And he sends us a challenge that if we just believe him and trust him, we will see God do incredible things, not just for us, but for future generations. And sometimes we fail and we have to, like snakes and ladders that came, we have to go right back 
um, to the start or, or very near the start mm. and start the process again. So um, if you remember the story, story of the centurion when Jesus um, uh, was going to the centurion's house. Such was the centurion's faith. He said, just say the word because, mm. you know, my understanding of what is divine is that you work on a different plane in a different dimension and your word is power. Um, and just say the word. And Jesus said that this is such a great manifestation of faith. And he said the word and it was done. So Moses could have had this experience. Um, uh, and that would have been one of the, the main spiritual objectives um, and denying the children of Israel the water because of Moses' mistake um, would not have demonstrated anything. It would just have frustrated the matter um, and they would have become even more frustrated mm-hmm. as a result. Mm. Yep, good points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just picking up there, Sharon, would you say there was any spiritual significance to how God intended you know, this water of life to flow? Um, okay, so I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, because that says, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So um, that's telling us that spiritual rock was Christ. Christ, as the rock, was smitten so that the water of life would flow for us to drink from him. The gushing water is a symbol of Christ, the living water. God wants to give his people living water. Though the people of God may be striving, be unhappy, murmuring and complaining, what is in God's heart is to give them, give us water to drink. Um, God took care of the Israelites and provided them with food, manna every day. And on the other hand, he quenched their thirst by being a rock that followed them. And that rock flowed out water. How can someone satisfy the hunger and quench the thirst of more than 2 million people for 40 years in the wilderness? Mm. Only God could do that. You know, in our Christian life, as we journey with God in the wilderness, we need to eat Christ as our daily manna, and we need to drink of him as a smitten rock that flows out the spirit to quench our thirst. God wanted the people to know that if they fully depended on him, he would provide for their every need. And so when we even see his interaction with the woman, um, Samaritan woman in John 4, 13 and 15, she recognized that what um, Christ was offering her was um, water that would mean that she would never thirst again. So again, you know, the gushing water is a symbol of Christ the living water. Mm, mm, powerful. Thank you. Um, Elder David, anything to add to what Sharon said there? Um, I, only that, uh, absolutely a wonderful imagery you've painted there, Sharon. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, and um, I just want to add that, you know, God is all powerful and, and through Christ that is manifested. And he is the source of the, you know, the, the true living water. Um, and flowing water should um, have a calming effect um, uh, you know, he leadeth me besides the waters, you know. Um, so that should be the, you know, not only a spiritual effect, but that water gushing out should have been a calming effect of, uh, as well. Mm. And the flowing water should have done more than just satisfy thirst, as, as has been pointed out. They should have seen Moses and God in a different light. And, and maybe they would have seen a manifestation of God descend upon Moses if he had done what was right. Um, as it did with Christ, uh, when it says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There would have been um, um, a, a, a commendation uh, uh, um, spiritually and physically that Moses had done the right thing and he was therefore suitable to take them on to the next level. So, but we will never know. We'll never know. Um, but we know that if we pursue that which is right and do what God wants us to do, um, only, only the, the most richest blessings will follow us. Thank you. Thank you both for that powerful imagery and, and, and the way that came across. Pastor Royston, let me come over to you. Thank you, Elder Johnny. <coughs> um, Alana, in response to your question, says, um, um, you know, when you talk about is, is in life, there may be some people that just seem to wind you up. Alana says she, she, she you know, she learns to, um, to pray and mm-hmm. ask God to bridle her tongue. 
and I need to speak to Alana. <laughs> Just teach your pastor how to pray sometimes. Um, I think Elder Mombi made a point. I'm, I'm going to come to the point here. He says, leadership is hard work. It can drive you to frustration and, and sometimes anger. And, and that is so true. Um, that is so true. Because even as a pastor sometimes, you go home and you're kicking, you're kicking everything around you. Um, when I mean everything, I mean you're kicking, you're kicking the books, you're kicking a ball, you know, you are. Thank you, you for are. clarifying that. Pastor. Yes, not people, just things. <clears throat> just, just don't get me. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, but anyway, right. I'm not talking about myself here. Right. Marie says, Marie Kuti says we must learn to rise above it. Anthony talks about switching off. Genevieve B says invite God to take control. Rodney says self must decrease or die. Alana Carline says, pray for a bridal tongue. Um, so different people, Elder Johnny, seems to be doing different things to deal with that issue. Um, Rose says, we need to pray for the spirit of calmness. Mm. When, when with those who irritate us, we can change how we respond to them as we cannot change others. Yes. I've learned that you cannot change others, but you can change yourself. Mm. The response you give um, is critically important. Here we go. Um, Caroline says, in my, in my own experience, I pray every morning and ask God to help me to respond and to react to others in such a way to bring honor and glory to him, and it makes a difference. Yes. Now, here is Roxy Rufus. Roxy is a good friend of mine. She's from Nigeria. She's now in, studying in, in Wolverhampton. She says, if you cannot walk away from toxic people because they can frustrate one's effort, it is wise to pretend they never exist in our circle and keep asking God for grace to carry on with your calling. Mm. Quite an interesting um, um, concept there. But can I zero in on something? Because this is coming in, Elder Johnny. The fact that God told Moses to speak to the rock. Yes. Right? And Moses struck the rock. And water still came out. I, I mean, think about it. So was Moses right in saying, you uh, drinky rebel? In other words, I'm doing this right. But Peter Burton made this point. Unlike some humans, God's intention is not to embarrass people in public. Mm. Hence, allowing water to still flow from the rock. He prefers to deliver some messages on a one-to-one -one basis. And I, you know what? I was thinking about it all week. God still performed a miracle. That's right. Even though Moses did the wrong thing. Here is what the wounded healer says. So water came from the rock when Moses struck it. Not because or despite Moses' mistake. Now here's, here's the punchline, Ella Johnny, and my viewers. And thank you for this wounded healer. But because God was the one providing for his people both physically and spiritually. Amen. I think, Elder Johnny, this is the quotation for the morning. Amen. Over to you. Amen, amen. Powerful thoughts. Keep them coming in class. We, we are enjoying our lesson study this morning. Going out with another question for you then. Without the benefit of hindsight, as we have today, could God's judgment on Moses have appeared harsh or unfair to the children of Israel? And if so, why? So share with us. Remember, take it from the children of Israel's point of view. They know they probably complained a bit too much, although they felt they had a valid reason. And now they're hearing this judgment. So with uh, the, the benefit of hindsight as we had, could God's judgment on Moses have appeared harsh or unfair to the children of Israel? And if so, why or why not? Let's hear your thoughts on that. Uh, Elder Johnny. Go ahead, sir. I, I have something coming in on, on WhatsApp, and I totally forgot we had WhatsApp, right? Go ahead. Um, it says, Moses didn't disbelieve God could supply water. If he spoke to the rock, he was just too angry and impatient to do it. So, so out of frustration, he lashed out and used his rod to smash into the rock twice. And then it goes on to say, it's a long one, you remember when he smashed the tablets of stone and grounded up the golden calf 
with water. I think the person is looking at a pattern here okay. that Moses had. But even in such anger, angry state as God's representative, heaven expect better of Moses and Aaron. But God wouldn't have Moses' bad behavior usurp his plan to provide water for his people. For God's purpose is greater than even our bad behavior. Yes. I think this is the quote for the morning. Sorry, wounded warrior. <laughs> I'm going to have to take that back. Um, <clears throat> God wouldn't have Moses' bad behavior usurp his plan to provide water <clears throat> for his people. For God's purpose is greater than even our bad behavior. And as a pastor, I say, quite often I do make these mistakes, but ultimately God's purpose seems to be shining forth. Thank you, Elder Neil, for this powerful point. Over to you, Elder Johnny. Amen. Thank you very much. So, and keep your points coming in um, as to whether God's judgment appeared harsh or unfair to the children of Israel. In the meantime, I want you to picture this scene. Moses is now heading off in the distance, probably getting smaller and smaller as they see. He's on his own. He's heading up the mountain. So, Sister Sharon, let's just look at the final chapter of Deuteronomy 34. We'll take the first six verses, please, if you can. Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through to 6. And again, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Then Moses went up from the plains of Mohab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilad as far as Dan, all Natali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zor. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moham, um, opposite Beth Peru. But no one knows his grave to this day. Um, and so we see that Moses stumbled at the finish line. Um, but I, I, I read this and I, I am thinking the way Moses and God prepared Moses to die. Personally, I think it's wonderful because he had time to make things right with God, although he was accustomed to doing that really all the time. And I think the lesson for us is that let's live right with God every day. Yes, he stumbled, but Moses, um, was living with God on a daily basis. He had that connection. You know, apparently you cannot see all the land which is mentioned in the text from Mount Pisgah because there are other mountains which obstruct this view. And obviously with the natural heart, eye, you can only see so far. Mm. So Moses was given an extended, um, para, you know, a, a, a paramatic kind of like, um, panoramic, sorry, view of the promised land of Canaan. Moses saw this with his natural eyes, but Moses saw much more through the eyes of faith, seeing the promises which God had made to the tribes of Israel through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It shows us that God is a covenant-keeping God. Mm. He did not have to show Moses the land, but in love he did. Um, he is faithful but he said he would not go over. And I, I like that because God doesn't push people into the back door. You know, God's no respecter of person. Um, a holy God cannot um, stand sin. And so he was not going to excuse Moses' sin, regardless how, of how good their relationship um, was, because obedience is the key. And when we look to verse 5, um, it's, it says Moses, the servant of the Lord. And I like that because Moses fell, but Moses got back up again mm. and God still regarded him ha as his servant. So, you know, not Moses, a great leader, the servant of God. Um, 
So most, more than anything, Moses was a sinner saved by grace. Mm. Um, he had accomplished the purpose that God wanted him to. Um, Moses didn't die alone. God was with him and God is enough. Mm. You know, he had accomplished the purpose for which God had set him. And the question for us is, are we accomplishing our purpose, our God-given purpose? So, you know, the fact that no one knew where he was buried, um, that says to me that God didn't want people to make a shrine to, to him um, after, after he has died and gone. You know, when the time comes for us to die, the important thing is not how grand our funerals are, but the greatness in terms of our lives. In fact, how we live now will determine how we die. Mm. Moses lived in the heights and he died in the heights. He often met God on the mountain, saw his glory and experienced his grace. You know, we need to do likewise. Although Moses failed, he was able to repent and get back up again. Amen. Thank you very much. So Moses had a mountaintop experience. We can see where that expression comes from. Um, Elder David, let's continue, please. Uh, verses 7 through to 12 of the same Deuteronomy 34. Yes, reading from verse 7 from the King James Version. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hand upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose, arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of the Egypt or to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And in all that mighty hand and in all that, sorry, and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the, in the sight of all Israel. One of the great things that you notice here that um, Moses was 120 years old. Um, from the calculations that we've made. And it tells us that he still had a fantastic vision and none of his strength. In other words, he was walking around like a 20-year-old. Mm -hmm. And this was just uh, a, 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 you know, a supernatural manifestation of what the Spirit of God can do for us. Mm. You know, obviously we as a church have a health message and we believe that it's important to do what is right and to, and, and to eat right, etc. But you could eat as much as you want, exercise as much as you want. If you don't have the Spirit of God working with you, all of uh, that, that we learn through um, uh, our, our health message will come to naught. Um, so it was important to, to, to read that to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that, that Moses was still a powerful and strong individual. Also, uh, from verse 9, it says, and Joshua, this was after he had died, um, but it says, and Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses has laid his hands upon him. Um, again, this is just an incredible message for me. This laying of hands is not just a, a ritual process. This was almost like the downloading of certain data and information into the very being of, um, of Joshua. And I think it's important to understand that um, this is... The, the essence of, of spiritual power, that whatever you do, wherever you go, is tainted, or once say tainted, but touched hmm. by the Spirit of God. Uh, and there was um, not a prophet like Moses in Israel. So Moses is considered, by the Word of God, one of the greatest prophets, if not the greatest prophet, that ever came um, out of Israel. And so we see here that God have used Moses in an incredibly uh, powerful way. A, and he still had enough strength and power to carry on as the leader um, for many years to come because physically, chronologically, he was not ready to die. But God had basically said that you will not go over and therefore that was the case. So God had preserved his life um, to do a specific purpose. And when that purpose was completed, God put him to sleep. But I think that helped me to appreciate and understand sometimes when we see our loved ones lost or we see people we feel 
we're just too young to die. Mm. Or we feel, uh, we see, you know, that, um, again, the, the tragedy of death uh, amongst our very own. And sometimes we are comforted by the fact that they have done all what God has asked them to do. And the fact that we are still alive yes. means that God has got a work for us to do. Regardless of how old we are, we, we have, God has not put us into retirement. We have still got a lot of work to do as we see time wrap, wrapping up, as we see all of the prophecies that we as a church have been presenting year in, year out come to fruition uh, are fulfilled before our eyes, what is it that God wants us to do? Are we filled with his spirit? Are we able to say to God, I have done all that you've asked me to do? And I think this is one of the greatest things which I saw presented here, uh, that Moses had done everything that God had asked him to do. Thank you, Elder. Thank you, Sharon. Both of you quite comprehensive. Sharon, I, I mean, you were quite full in everything that you said. Is there anything you wanted to come back on in terms of what Elder David just shared? You're just on mute, Sharon. Yeah, just quickly commenting on what David brought out in verse 9 in terms of um, Moses laying hands on Joshua, who was filled with the spirit of wisdom. You know, I think one of the points for me is that leaders come and go, mm. but God's spirit is eternal. Yes. You know, he is the main factor in good leadership and fruitful ministry. Amen. Well said. Thank you very much. Pastor, what's happening online? Please? Well, let me go to live stream first. Um, you know, Elder Moambeth talks about hope of resurrection he said God is faithful and he said he felt sorry for Moses <laughs> I mean that he saw the promised land but ultimately um, the ultimate promise of promises was fulfilled um, Clive says amen sister Sharon mm. thank you for that powerful point um, you know Moses got a chance to rebuild um, Alana says be, be obedient regardless of um, the way you feel or, or what you're experiencing Sunson says, you know, one can assume that Moses asks for, 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 for forgiveness. Karen Beebe says, um, Karen Beebe says, harsh, looking at, you know, God um, mm -hmm. taking Moses, um, burying him. Harsh but fair. God had, a plan for, God had a plan for Moses' life. Just as God has a plan for our lives, just shows us that getting to that ultimate goal doesn't come easy. Thanks for that point. I like the point that Sunson makes. He says that God's grace is the message for all of us. Mm. And I think that's a powerful point, that God's grace is the message for us. And he says, have you noticed that Moses and Jesus was shown a, a panoramic view? You know, say, remember Satan took um, yes. Jesus up and showed him all of that, right? Mm. They saw um, all of that. Peter Burton says, God's judgment on Moses may have appeared harsh because of what he did for many years, but that reinforces salvation by works. The bottom line is that Moses was a sinner and the wages of sin yes, is death. death. Mm. But can I add, um, Elder Peter, but the gift of God All right. is eternal life All right. through that's Jesus a nice, Christ. That's a nice segue into, Our Lord. into where we're going. Thank I know, you. I know it's going, but can I just read what Julian... Go ahead. Just go ahead. two more. Um, the punishment to Moses may have seemed harsh to the Israelites, but it was important that they realize that obedience to God is vital. I'm going to read one more, Elder Johnny. Um, somebody who I've not mentioned before, Alethea Sinclair says, the rock represents Christ in this scenario. Christ was speaking, Christ was saying, speak to me, but instead of frustration, gave rise to anger and disobedience to place. That was not the one I wanted to read. Yvette, right, Yvette. Yvette Bradford says, God showed Moses the promised land. He buried Moses himself. And if that wasn't enough, he came back and took him to heaven with him. What a God we serve. Amen. But so, uh, Elder John, I wanted to throw in this one. If I don't read Duane, I won't forgive me. So let me just read what Duane has to say. Go ahead. I think God in his mercy put Moses to sleep so he can save his soul. Mm. Looking at Moses' pattern of anger, he may have lost his soul had he continued to live. Mm -hmm. Powerful thought. Class is on fire. Thank you. Keep your thoughts coming in this morning. So this week's lesson was entitled The Resurrection of Moses. And this is where we are at. Going out with a question to you. What biblical evidence can you share as proof or evidence that Moses believed 
in the resurrection. So those Bible scholars and theologians out there, share what you know to prove that Moses believed in the resurrection. So there was no funeral cortege. There were no coffin bearers. There were no flowers and no tomb for this great man, bearing in mind what Sister Sharon has already said. Surely, Moses should have at least had a memorial of such. Elder David, coming to you now, remind us what our memory verse says in Jude 9, and expand on that, please, if you will. Mm. Uh, very interesting. Um, Jude 9, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Mm. Um, interesting, there's a couple of points in, in Jude that um, uh, are mentioned only in Jude and not in other texts. So um, he gets his source um, of information from other uh, um, uh, texts of antiquity, which probably do not exist um, today. Um, but um, in uh, looking at the attitude towards sinners in, in, in the whole text, or the attitude of sinners, he gives various examples, Sodom and Gomorrah and the angels, etc., etc., and he comes here, um, uh, and, and the title in my King James Version to this passage is called The Defiant Attitude of Sinners. Um, but the, the, the thing that we need to understand, that everything is based upon legality. You know, and the, the, the legal system within, within this country is based upon the word of God. I think it was Pastor Cavallo who directed my attention once to the Royal Courts of Justice. And he, he told me, look, what do you see? Um, as I looked at, across uh, Fleet Street at the building uh, and I pointed out that on the Royal Courts of Justice, there are three statues, one of Moses, um, one of Solomon. And above that, there's one of Jesus Christ. So the whole legal system which we have in this country, um, and maybe throughout the world in, in the democratic um, settings, is, is based upon the word of God. So when I see this, I see here a legal challenge. There would appear to be that Satan legally challenged um, uh, the right of Michael, and uh, for those listening, um, Michael is described as the archangel. Um, we as Adventists, in terms of our doctrine, um, understand that this Michael is also Jesus Christ himself, based upon uh, the way in which he is introduced in the scriptures. And, and given that it was uh, the archangel that came down, uh, and the, 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 the work of resurrection is something that Christ can do alone, not an, uh, not an angel, that this angel would have been the angel responsible for resurrecting Moses. And it's been disputed. In other words, um, a decision has been made by the high court judge, which is God himself, and it is now being disputed by um, uh, uh, the accuser, Satan, um, and his solicitors have requested a, what we call, in legal terms, a judicial review. They want, uh, he's appealing that they look at this act and, and realize that according to the law, the Bible says that, you know, from dust you came and dust you will return. So by law, he should, um, uh, uh, Satan is claiming that, that the body of Moses and everything that Moses represented belongs to him. And also the death of Moses is a representation that the law of God does not work. And the angel basically said, which is Jesus Christ says, the Lord rebuked him and didn't go into any debate because it was it is evident that behind the sin, Adam and Eve, when they when, when they did uh, what God asked them not to do, Satan was there undermining the word of God. And throughout all of the troubles that took place within the, uh, the 40 year period on, in the desert, at the times of rebellion and, and, and stick nakedness uh, that God pointed out, it was Satan who was undermining the word of God. So there was no dispute. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. And so what about the situation? If Christ had not died as yet, how is it that Satan, um, that, that, that Moses is resurrected? Mm. It's based on the fact, and when I was reading um, Isaiah 57, verse, um, uh, verse 15, when it, when it says, Thus says the Lord who, 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 uh, who um, inhabits eternity. You see, with God, you know, he inhabits eternity. 
Um, so he can work in every dimension based upon his law. But the interesting thing is, is that Moses is bailed out, literally. Um, we all understand what it is when you are accused of a crime, but you can get bail subject to a trial and subject to you being proven innocent. And if, um, if you're proven um, guilty, then you'd obviously go back to jail. But you can get bail. And Jesus Christ literally has bailed out Moses on the proviso that in the future, he will send Jesus Christ to pay the ultimate price. Amen. Fantastic message. Amen. Great. Thank you very much. If anybody didn't understand that, hopefully that's really clear. Um, but Sharon, coming to you, how does this account of Moses help you to understand the depth of the plan of salvation, that even before the cross, Moses would be raised to immortality? I mean, Elder David touched on that, but just to hear from yourself. I just think that the, you know, the plan of salvation was a foolproof plan, one which was um, that had been rubber stamped with victory. Failure had no part to play in it. You know, Christ had decided a long time ago that he was going to go all the way and pay the price for our sins with his blood so that we can inherit eternal life by receiving the sacrifice that he paid on the cross. I believe that Christ so set his mind that nothing was going to come between him, his father and the Holy Spirit in order to achieve the reality of the plan. Mm. All angles were covered. Moses represents all those who have died believing in Christ. So gives us hope that if we are faithful, we too, like Moses, will be resurrected by Christ to enjoy eternal life with him. What a sacrifice that Christ has paid. It also reminds me that Christ has done and continues to do everything possible in order to save us. Amen. Pastor, let me take some comments from you now. Yes, I know we're winding down, Elder Johnny, aren't we? Mm. Um, Geraldine points to um, the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, 1 to 9. Moses turning up, Elijah turning up, um, and there was Jesus, right? Um, Carol um, says we should read chapter 43 of the book, Patron, Patriots and Prophets. She said, the death of Moses is fascinating, absorbing reading. So there you go. Read that. Um, Elder Mombi says, Moses died in the hope of resurrection. He had the ultimate promise of the resurrection. Um, Alana made this point here. Try and get across here. She says, um, she says, the GPS, I like that, God's plan of salvation is depicted in John chapter 1, 1 to 3, and Revelation 14, verse 12. Powerful point that one is. Um, but here's a point that um, Angela says. She says, Moses' death was not a tragedy because he died in the blessed hope. Mm. And without a firm faith, and, and, and with a firm faith in God, no evil plan, force can stop God and, and hold him back. When God is for us, who can be against us? Um, Rodney Smith made for me the point, you know, the points of the day keep changing for me, Elder Johnny. <laughs> he, says God, he says, Jesus is the best defense attorney. Hmm. And David talked about the legal aspect of the text. Yeah. And um, Jesus turned up and he did. Jesus is the best law in the universe. He alone is able to clear a man guilty of sin. And I said, amen for that. So those are the points that are coming great, through. Great, great, great. I mean, it sounds to me, Pastor, that um, there's already kind of testimonies going on there. So, you know, my, my final question for our listeners and our viewers. Peter, James, and John were excited on the Mount of Transfiguration to see Moses, Elijah, with Christ. What excitement, viewers and listeners, and encouragement do you feel about Moses appearing on the Mount of Transfiguration. You've heard what Sharon had to say and some of the comments are coming in. So continue and share your excitement, your encouragement of Moses appearing on the Mount of Transfiguration. Can I clear up a point, Elder Johnny? Go ahead, sir. A, Manroop, a Manroop, I think it's a relative of yours, right? Tony Monroop, Anthony Monroop. Okay, yeah. right. It was significant that Moses repented of his sin, otherwise the devil might have had a claim on Moses' body. Instead, because of God, instead, because God forgave him of his sin and because he was faithful to God in life. 
So let us not get from the idea that because, you know, he struck the rock and he, he had to repent. Yes. He had to give himself back to God. And, and, and that point um, is powerful. Thank you. So as we know, there was another saviour who came to emancipate man from the bondage and condemnation. Just like Moses, he had to die, but not because he sinned. Sister Sharon, just remind us what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 13 through to 17 about the great resurrection, please. And again, reading from the New King James Version, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified um, that God, that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. If in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Mm. You are still in your sins. Mm. So, so Paul is saying here that, you know, if there's no, there's no resurrection of the dead, then our hope, our faith is in vain because this is what it's all about. Mm. The great controversy is about life and death. The sin problem is about life and death because Romans 6, 23, if we've already heard, tells us that the wages of sin is death. Mm. Put simply, choose Christ, live forever, choose Satan, die eternal death. Mm. Paul asks, um, is Christ not risen? If you deny the general resurrection, you are also denying the well-established resurrection of Christ. So in other words, you are removing the Christian hope of eternal life. Mm. If one tried to preach the gospel without the resurrection of Christ, this would be vain as it robs it of a central historical fact. Christ repeatedly spoke about rising from the dead. We see that in Matthew 16 and Matthew 17, 23, etc. Also baptism, which is a type of death, burial and resurrection of Christ would lose its significance if there were no resurrection for the exaltation is given to rise and walk in newness of life, mm. even as Christ was raised from the dead. Amen. Amen. Um, Elder David, continue for us, please. Same chapter, verses 18 through to 22. Yeah. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says here, Then they also, which have fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. That's following on from verse 17. Um, so, um, and then moving on, it says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, of all men, the most miserable. Mm. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them which slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Um, it's, I just get so I want to read on, but uh, yeah, to 22. Um, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, obviously the, 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 the resurrection and, and the state of the dead and etc. Is, is something which um, is disputed uh, quite a lot. Um, I'll just go, uh, try to elaborate on this by giving an experience, which I had two weeks ago. I was asked to sing at um, on a Sunday morning at an Anglican church um, uh, at a memorial service. And during that service, so it was a traditional um, Anglican church in Battersea, um, very nicely decorated, been there for probably a couple of hundred years. Um, and during this memorial, the uh, congregation were uh, uh, giving tributes to a lost uh, a loved one who had passed a year before and during the pandemic many couldn't attend the funeral and so they were having this memorial service and as you often hear during the um during this type of service you have people speak as though they're speaking to their past one you know rest in peace we love you we'll, we know you're looking down upon us etc etc and then 
this Anglican priest who looked just like how we expect an Anglican priest to look with his frock and everything else, presented in 10 minutes just this incredible, powerful message. He said that many of us speak about the dead, okay, as though they're spirits all around us and they're looking down upon us. And he said, this is not what the Bible teaches. Mm. He says, what we need to be looking to is the resurrection. Mm. And, and I was so blessed by that message and so blessed by the reality that God has his people, whether it be Sabbath or Sunday, preaching the message of resurrection. And there's no better message of the resurrection as is found to, to basically pull together what what um, what Paul was saying in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, where he says, I am, uh, Jesus is saying in, in John 11, verse 25, he, when he's speaking to, to Martha, he says, I am the resurrection yes. and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, hmm. that is all those who have died before Christ came hmm. to this, uh, came, uh, actually came on earth, yet shall he live, and Moses has a sample of that, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believeth thou this. Mm. This is a powerful and wonderful message backed up by what Sister White says. I'll do this very quickly. Uh, she comments on this text, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. She says, our personality, the identity is preserved in the resurrection. And as we've read from John, the resurrection is Jesus Christ. Though not the same particles of matter or material substance, uh, an incredible statement given that matter and uh, particles was new language based upon an emerging science uh, based upon quantum physics, a part of his matter uh, 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 as, as went into the grave. So nothing that goes into the grave will make us up as we are uh, when Christ comes. The wondrous works of God are a mystery to man. She says the spirit, the character of man is returned to God there to be preserved. And when I read this, uh, no more did I mourn mm. or did I feel an emptiness for my loved ones to know that the loved ones which I've known who have trusted in Christ are preserved, uh, not in a, a, a what we understand as living, but their character, their spirit are preserved in Christ. Amen. Amen. Powerful testimony. Thank you for sharing that. Pastor, final comments, please. Final comments for 2021, Elder Johnny, mm. from our viewers. And we want to thank you for staying with us, for being with us. And we, I, I'm going to try and do as many as I quickly can in as short time as I can. So basically, Marie Kute says, um, the resurrection of Jesus guarantees salvation. So, so said Rod Simit. So said v, v, VK. So said Amwenga, who says, um, um, if there's no resurrection, then Christianity is a massive hoax. That is so true. Um, and then a lot of people are saying a lot of stuff, Elder Johnny. Um, um, Angela Green says the resurrection of Moses proved that we as sinners can experience resurrection when we ask God for, for forgiveness and renew our faith. Um, 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 Julian Wainwright says there's hope in Moses' resurrection due to sin. Men die, but there's hope in life after death through Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop there. If there's no resurrection, then we are we then we are believing a lie in the bible and the bible is false that is so true tom tom says the appearance of moses at transfiguration we affirm the principle of salvation is by faith alone mm. not by our works amen, amen. Erlene over there in, in montreal says my excitement is i want to see jesus the one who died for me the resurrection of moses rem remind me that god's words are truth rodney Simmons says if all this life held was to love God and die the same death as the person in the world. What hope would we have? The second coming of Jesus is the capstone of, of the gospel. Um, Brother Cyril, Deacon Cyril Edwards says, if all this life held was to love God, and sorry, he says Moses represents the dead in Christ. Elijah represents those who will be translated and Christ is our resurrected savior. You know, talking about what happened on the Mount of, the Mount of Transfiguration. Gerald Dean says, this text excites me. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up. This commandment have I received of my father. Um, Andres Malcolm over there in Jamaica. Hello, Pastor Malcolm. He says, thank God for the cross. 
Had it not been for the plan of salvation, we have no gospel to preach. Thus, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection gives us hope. Cheryl says, nice to see Sister Cheryl, and say hello um, to your husband for me. When you, are, when, when you are wrong, never feel you are too big to say sorry. And that was what Moses did by repenting of his mistake. Hello, Paulette over there in Bermuda. Rodney says, there they, they used to be a, a very popular song in our church, if heaven was never promised to me, neither all the things of eternity. It'd be worth it just having the Lord in my life. That's a lie. Mm. And Duane just jumped in to, for me to read the last one, says, though we know the resurrection is true, and really the question is, where is your name written? Over to you, Elder John. Amen. Panelists, just before I hand back to Elder Valsi, let's have your final 30-second takeaway points for today and, and, and for the quarter. Um, let me go to Sister Sharon, first of all. Okay, so Moses lived in God's will and died in God's will. You never have to fear life or death if you walk in obedience um, with the Lord. You know, Moses died the death of the righteous because he lived the life of the righteous. Moses lived with a forward vision and he died with a forward vision as he viewed the promised land. The nation so often wanted to go back to Egypt, but he challenged them to go forward to the inheritance, what God had prepared for them. Indeed, God has prepared a place for each one of us. He does not want us to have a look at it. He wants us to enter into eternity with him. Amen. So why not accept his invitation today? Amen. Thank you, Sharon. Elder David. Yes. Um... As I looked um, uh, at summarizing this, I just in, in Deuteronomy chapter 3, it reads, And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant the greatness and the mighty hand, but what God is there in heaven or on earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? And, it, and Moses goes on, and this really hurt me to hear his plea. I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon. And it goes on to say, but the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee and speak no more unto me of this matter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it reminds me of my father when we used to beg him mm -hmm. um, if we'd done something wrong because you hadn't tidied your room, you were going to lose out on something and don't speak to me on this matter again. And that was final. But I knew that uh, he was sort of looking at me through the corner of his eye uh, because he had something greater in store mm -hmm. for me. And sometimes he would come back with a treat, some sweets or something um, just to say, you know, I understand. And um, so I just really want to um, conclude with, with what Job says uh, in terms of my takeaway for this whole quarter is that for I know my Redeemer lives. Yes. Job, this is Job 19, verse uh, 20, 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the last day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy the God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall be within me. Thank you. Thank you. We had a bit of disruption there, but I think everybody understood the message. And finally, Pastor Royston. I'm going to read what Marcia, um, Marlene Cornwall James says. Hallelujah. Amen. He's alive. My hope is not in vain. All the way from Trinidad. That is spreading right across the world. Hallelujah. Amen. He's alive. My hope is not in vain. Thank you very much. The message of Deuteronomy is as relevant for us today as it was for Israel back then. Let us pray to be obedient. Let us pray to remain faithful and not neglect that sweet hour of prayer. May I thy consolation share, till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight. In my immortal flesh I'll rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. 
Thank you all so much. Thank you to all the panelists throughout the whole of this quarter. Thank you for those of you that have tuned in and continue to tune in for our wonderful Bible study time. Thank you as ever to our PA team who were stretched over the last couple of weeks, but God came through for them and enabled us to still stay online. We move into a new lesson. As Pastor said, next quarter, we're going to study the book of Hebrews. Be sure to study and to join us to find ourselves approved. Over to you, Elder Valsi. Thank you so much, um, Elder Johnny and Pastor Smith and to the AV team for their participation. I want to say a special thank you to the online viewers who have been supporting us throughout the year. And I know you started off as visitors, but I want to ensure you you're now family. We have worked together throughout the year. We have got to know you. You have got to know us. And we have been truly blessed by your contribution and um, for always being there for us. So and for our members who have been supportive, whether in person or online, we want to say a special thank you again. God has blessed us. I know we have not come to the end of the year as yet, but this is our last Sabbath for 2021, and we give God all the glory, the honor, and the praise. He has been a wonderful and a merciful God. So thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness. Thank you, everyone, for supporting the Sabbath School. Let us pray. Father God, we are so blessed to have you as our Father. We thank you, dear God, for your presence throughout the year. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your support. We thank you for all the resources you have given us that we can study and we can share your love with others. May your presence, your sweet communion, be with us and guide us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.